revolution from 1910 to 1920, many more Mexicans fled to the United States hoping for a safer and better life. The United States welcomed these new immigrants because they needed workers for many growing industries, such as agriculture, mining, construction, and transportation. Even though Mexican Americans worked some of the most difficult jobs, the towns and cities where they lived were segregated for many years. There were stores, restaurants, schools for Mexicans at separate businesses and schools for white people. Hundreds of thousands of other Americans who had lost their jobs headed to California to find work. California was suffering from the Great Depression too. But there was no drought in California, and because the state had some of the richest farmland in the world, workers were needed to pick crops, which included tomatoes, lettuce, grapes, avocados, strawberries, Shit. 
and their civil Valley. 
teachers to support their strike. Soon students, churches, church leaders, lawyers, government officials, and national labor organizations offered to help them. Cesar was pleased. It's amazing they all work together. That's the miracle of it all, he said. Volunteers gave time, money, and donations of food and clothing. Some even marched with them on the picket lines. It was very difficult for the workers to stay on strike. They weren't earning any money and couldn't pay their bills. Some left the area to find jobs elsewhere. Some picked different crops for other growers. Some even went back to work for the grape growers. But the migrants who did stay with the strike believed their goal was worth fighting for. To make sure their grapes didn't rot on the vines, the growers brought in pickers from outside the San Joaquin Valley. They came from Mexico and from poor neighborhoods in the city of Los Angeles. Then winter arrived, and the growers didn't even need workers. The strike seemed to be losing its energy. So Cesar decided to affect the growers in a different way. He sent out volunteers to block the grape deliveries on loading docks in Los Angeles and San Francisco. He didn't want any of the grapes that had been picked to arrive at grocery stores and markets. He also urged people to boycott, to refuse to buy grapes from companies that were unfair to their workers. News of the situation in Delano had reached the U.S. government in Washington, D.C. Some members of Congress were working toward changing the National Labor Relations Act to finally protect farm workers. The National Labor Relations Act had been passed in 1935 to give employees in many industries the right to form labor unions that would help protect their rights to fair wages and safe workplaces. But it specifically did not include farm workers. On March 14, 1966, Senator Robert F. Kennedy and other members of Congress came to Delano to discuss the issue. The committee questioned the sheriff, who had arrested strikers who hadn't broken any laws. Senator Kennedy scolded him and told him to take some time during his lunch break to read the Constitution of the United States. The strike had been going on for about six months. Workers wouldn't be needed vineyards for months, so Cesar wanted to find a way to keep everyone's attention. He wanted to remind the entire community that the strike was still going on in Delano. He decided to lead a march to Sacramento, the capital of California. Cesar believed that people marching together would draw more attention to the strike. It would unite the farm workers, and would help grow the union by bringing in even more members as they passed through barrios along the route from Delano to Sacramento.
the summer of 1967, the grape strike was finishing its second year. The union had signed contracts with some of the grape growers in Delano, but there were still hundreds of thousands of farm workers who were not protected. As always, Cesar was determined to do more. Chapter 6 Ending The Great Grape Strike Cesar had always believed that peaceful actions were more powerful than violence, but not all union members agreed with him. They were frustrated that the strike was still going on, and while the trade union did its best to take care of their needs, they were still living in poverty. Some union members destroyed the growers' property, or threatened workers in the fields to get their boss's attention. Cesar knew these violent actions would hurt the way people saw the union. He thought of Gandhi and the tools he had used to keep to help bring change to India. Gandhi had often fasted, stopping eating for a period of time to make a point. So Cesar decided to do, to do the same. He stopped eating on February 15, 1968, and he planned to fast until the UFWOC members agreed to stop using violence against the growers. His sacrifice of food was meant to remind union members of the sacrifices of time, money, and energy they still needed to make to keep the union going and to keep the community strong. During the fast, Cesar stayed at the new union headquarters called the Forty Acres on the edge of Delano. Thousands of people came to visit him. They treated the Forty Acres like a holy place. They lit candles, hung religious symbols, and held church services. Some women even painted the windows of Caesar's room to look like the stained glass window of a church. During the day, Caesar stayed in bed, reading, sleeping, or trying to do work. In the evenings, he met with visitors. People waited in two-hour lines just to talk to him. Donations poured in as word spread about Caesar's fast. But not eating was hard on Caesar. He had horrible pains in his head, stomach, legs, and he had lost more than 30 pounds. Helen told him he was crazy. She was worried for herself. The doctors were worried, too. Even Senator Kennedy urged him to stop his fast. Finally, Cesar decided he had made his point. He ended his fast after 25 days at a ceremony at Delano Park on March 10, 1968. Thousands of people, including the senator, gathered to share in the event. Only a few days after Cesar's fast ended, Senator Kennedy announced that he was running for president. Cesar and Dolores Huerta quickly agreed to support him. They campaigned for the senator all over California. On June 5, 1968, they were both with Kennedy in Los Angeles. Dolores even stood next to him as he gave a speech. But as Kennedy left the event, he was shot and killed. It was a national tragedy. Many were sure he would go on to win the Democratic nomination and maybe the presidency. Robert F. Kennedy wasn't the first civil rights supporter to be killed that year. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated just two months earlier. By this time, Cesar Chavez had become a national celebrity. 
foreign citizen.